There's a phenomenon called the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon. And basically what the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon is, is it's two different parts. One is, is this idea that when we begin to think in our minds about something new, that we begin to see it more frequently. If you've ever bought a car, you probably know this. You might be looking at a certain type of car. You're looking online or you go to a dealership and you're looking for a certain type of car and then you start to see it everywhere you drive for the next few days, right? It's that kind of picture. It's this kind of idea that we have this selective attention that happens in our minds. For you and I, every single day, everywhere we go, our minds are constantly filtering things out. We see millions of things all the time and our, con our minds are constantly filtering out what is most important and what happens is when something is brought to the forefront of our mind, now all of a sudden that piece comes to our attention. It's not because things around us have changed, but because our minds are now seeing things with a different context. So if you bought a car, you, you understand how that works. Another piece of this, the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon, is, is called the confirmation bias. And here's what that means, is that when I have this belief about how something is, then I start to see things more frequently that align with that belief. Now, we see this all the time right now when it comes to politics, it's everywhere, right? Everybody is only seeing what they already believe is true and nobody's changing their mind about anything at this time. It doesn't matter what's happening, we're just constantly seeing. And by the way, social media is intended and built to feed us those things that we already believe are true, so we're gonna see it more and more frequently, right? Now here's how this worked for me, is years ago my wife started watching, Craig talked about this I think last week or the week before, uh, she started watching the Hallmark Christmas specials. Now I'm not gonna have anybody raise your hand, I'm not gonna ask you if you watch these because I don't want you to embarrass yourself by having to raise your hand. But she started watching these things and then there was this conversation that happened and that later on that she said, why don't you ever watch these with me? They're cute shows or whatever, right? And I said, I, they're all the same. And she said, no, they're not. And she's like, sit down and watch this one. I said, I've already seen it. She says, no, you haven't. You haven't seen this one, it's brand new. And I was like, no, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. <laughs> it's all the same story. The story starts with this woman who lives in the city and she's dating a guy or engaged to a guy that looks like this, always. Right, sitting in his limo, in a suit and in a tie, on the phone, all that kind of stuff. And then she gets out of the big city for whatever reason to go visit grandma at her house or something and she meets a guy that's wearing flannel looking like this. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, here's another one. He looks like this. <laughs> Every now and then they mix it up and they put on this coat that makes him look like a country boy and it looks like this. Or they'll throw a vest over the flannel and a lot of times, even if they're wearing that coat, they have like a flannel scarf. I mean, like that's how it is all the time. And so what I was telling her that it's all the same story. I mean, it basically, they, they might mix up the characters a little bit. A few of the storylines might change, but basically it's always something along those lines. So I would always walk in, I'd be like, oh, that's the guy. And she's like, how do you know? I'm like, he's wearing flannel. <laughs> he's, that's the guy he's gonna, she's gonna end up with. Or you'll have like the guy who's working for his dad's company and they're gonna take over this small town business. You know, this woman owns a coffee shop or you know, a bookstore or something like that, you know, an art gallery or something. And she, he comes in and of course he's wearing a suit and when you know he's changed is when he's wearing flannel. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I don't know if he's the guy, but now I know because he's wearing flannel. Like that's how it is. And so I would literally, I'd walk in and out and I'd be like, that's the guy. And every time I'd walk through, I felt like I saw it. And here's the truth, it might not be true of every show, but because that's what I believed, I would see it. And because my mind now was open to thinking about that, and she laughs about it now, because she's like, oh, it actually is 100% true. You know, <laughs> but what would happen is I'd walk through, even if I'm just walking through the kitchen, I'd go, there it is, there it is, oh, that, that's it again, there it is, I see it. And I start to see it because now my mind has adjusted to see something more frequently that was always there, but now because I have this new compartment in my brain and in my mind, I'm seeing it more regularly. And that's what, that's what happens, that's the picture of what this is, the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon. Once you see something, you start seeing it all the time. Once it's brought to your attention, your, ba your brain and my brain begin to process things differently. Now, Craig asked me a couple weeks ago if I, would, uh, if I would come and fill in for this week, and I said, what would you like me to talk about? Is there a series or something we're in? And he said, you know what, why don't, we probably won't be in a series. Why don't you just uh, 
talk about whatever you think our, our congregation needs to hear this time. And God's been working this on my heart uh, in a lot of ways over the, over the last little while. And, um, and my prayer has been today for all of us that, that today we would walk in and that something would shift in our mind and the filter would change in our mind and we begin to see differently when we're gonna walk out of here. That something would happen in our mind and our heart and our soul that when we walk out of here, we'd start to see the world, start to see people, start to see Jesus differently than we ever have before. And then it'll start to change that as we walk out, we'll start to see over and over and over again something that, not, has, not something that's changed, but something that's always been there because we're starting to see things with different eyes. That's been my prayer. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter eight. We're gonna look at an amazing story of how Jesus saw the world and saw people. Luke chapter eight, starting in verse 40, says this. It says, on the other side of the lake, which was, he'd been on one side of the Sea of Galilee, he's going to the other side toward Capernaum. It says, on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. Now, this is a big deal. The crowds are around, so it's already a big deal because everybody's gathered around Jesus. They want to see what's going to happen next. But then this really important person in the community named Jairus comes up and asks him, says, I need you to come with me. So not only is everybody there to see Jesus, now somebody really important has engaged with him and wants him to come. And so Jesus is going to head with this guy. This is a really big moment, a really important moment the anticipation would be growing because this is a big deal. So Jairus, it says, verse 42, Jairus' only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. How old was she? 12 years old. She was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. This word surrounded literally means that he was pressed by the crowds. The word means he was crushed. He was being crushed. All the crowds are gathering around, getting so close that they're crushing in on him. This is what's happening. Verse 43 says, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. How long had she been suffering? 12 years. As long as this little girl had been living, this woman had been suffering with constant bleeding and she could find no cure. I'm gonna transition in the story to another gospel account in this little part because it shows us a few other pieces of the story. Mark chapter five picks up in this story. It says this, it says she had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had been suffering for 12 years. She had gone to all the doctors, everybody she knew that could help her. She had gone everywhere she could, paid everything she had, and she had not gotten better. In fact, she had gotten worse. People are suffering. And this is true for all of us. There are people around us that are suffering. And some of you might be sitting in here, you're like, you know what? It's not the people around me, it's actually me that's suffering. I want you to see where hope and where peace will come from. But I want us to see with new eyes that people around us are suffering. Verse 27, she had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowds and touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I could just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. This word that she had felt in her body was talking about that she didn't just touch Jesus' robe and go, man, I hope that worked. Or, you know what, it feels a little different. I'm, I'm hoping I got healed. No, it actually means she has this experiential knowledge that something has happened to her. That's what that word means. She could feel in her body, she had experience, and she knew when that happened that she had been healed. You can imagine if you've been suffering for 12 years, if you've been suffering with bleeding, this medical condition for 12 years, you can imagine that your body might be in tune if something has happened that has changed your life, right? So this is what it's talking about. How amazing would it be if the people that are around us that are suffering could feel deep in their soul, in the heart of who they are, in the core of who they are, that something has changed and something has shifted because of the work of God in their lives. That the Holy Spirit would be so obvious to them, the work of God, the Holy Spirit would be so obvious to them that they cannot mistake it to be the work of God. But look at Jesus' response, verse 30. It says, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? 
His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? Basically, he says, I knew that something happened. Who touched my robe? Jesus says, stop, we're all going, I know, but somebody just touched me. And remember what the verse said right before, that the crowds were pressing around him. So his disciples are going, what are you talking about, Jesus? You just asked who touched you? Everybody has been touching you, Jesus. We're all pressed in, like we're bumping into you because it's a big crowd that's pressing in. Why are you asking this kind of question? I start to think like what celebrities and athletes and stuff like that feel, right? Everywhere they go, there's always people trying to get close to them, always people reaching out, which is why they usually have an entourage around trying to create space and things like that, right? And they always walk through the crowd. You see them when they're walking off like a basketball court or a football field, right? Everybody's reaching out, trying to, trying to touch them, you know, trying to reach and hit their helmet or hit their head or you know, whatever it is, or trying to get a high five from them. And usually they'll just walk by kind of like this, right? I mean, they're not really engaging with anybody. They're just kind of, kind of slapping hands or sometimes they'll walk by and won't do any of that stuff. My favorite video is this video of Bill Belichick. Watch how he responds. Hoodie, hoodie at the ready indoors. Now look at that. He ain't shaking the kid's hands either. Let's get to the bus. I don't know him personally, but everything I know of Bill Belichick, this is not surprising at all. These poor kids, right? Now here's, here's the truth. Here's the truth. He's going to something important. He's focused, right? I don't know if he did that intentionally. He may have. I mean, I, Hearing some of his press conferences, he might have done that on purpose. But if he didn't, like he's just going to do something very important. And so he's focused on what's important and he's walking through. But Jesus doesn't respond like that. That's not how he works in a crowd. It says this in verse 32. But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. His disciples are like, what are you worried about? He keeps looking around to see who had done it. Then we'll go back to the Luke passage again, verse 47. It says, when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. She explained that she had been healed. Jesus responded, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. It says, while he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith and she will be healed. So what happens is he goes to the house, the daughter has died, and she, he ends up healing uh, this young girl. But I wanna come back and look at this story a little bit more in depth of this woman who'd reached out to Jesus. Because there's people all around us just like that that are desperate, that are hurting, looking for hope looking for healing, looking for peace, all these things. And here's what happens. People begin to ask these really important questions, these big questions, these existential questions. Not just of who I am, but if God exists, does he really care about me? Or does God even exist? And the way they translate those questions is by looking at those of us who claim the name of Jesus. So if you're in, the, in here today and you say, I am a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, then they transition that question to you. And they say, not only does God care about me, they say, the way I'm gonna know if God really cares about me is if the people who claim to know God really care about me. And do I know that God exists? Can I know that God exists? The way I'm gonna decipher that is by looking at the people who claim to know God and I wanna see if there's something different about their life than there is about my life. And they begin to transition all of those questions over to us. Does God really care about me? Does he really exist? And they look at us to make that determination. Whether we represent it right or not, they look at us. So the challenge today, if you remember nothing else, the challenge today is just to see people. To see people. Because what happens for a lot of us is, just like what's happening to Jesus, is that everything's kind of crowding in on us, where we kind of miss the fact that there's people that are hurting and in need around us. And that didn't happen to Jesus, but the disciples even expected it to happen, right? So not only is that true that a lot of times there's so much pressing in on us that we don't see people because we're so focused on ourselves and what's going on or just our little tiny circle. If it's not just ourselves, it might be just our family or just this little circle of people that we really care about that we miss on all the other sides. We miss seeing people for who they are and how God sees them. Craig talked last week about Romans chapter 12, verse two 
where it says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I've heard that verse and he unpacked it and told us what that means, but I've started thinking about it a little bit differently. A lot of times I always thought of not conforming to this world as being a way of saying, you know what, I'm gonna step back and stay away from the world and that way I don't conform. Because I always thought of it as like this active version of like I'm going to the world and I'm gonna shape myself to be more like the world. But recently I began to understand it as, as a different type of picture. I think about my kids when they have Play-Doh, right? They get those little shapes, you know, cookie cutters and things like that. They'll take Play-Doh and they'll press into it. Do you know what they don't go press into? They don't go get a rock from the outside and start pressing on it because it's not gonna do anything, right? But here's the reality. For all of us, the world is pressing and crushing in on us, no matter what, all the time. And so the importance that Craig talked about last week of being transformed by God's word, by the renewing of your mind in God's word, in his presence each day, is what solidifies us from the inside out. We're transformed from the inside out. And that way, when the world presses in on us, we're not like Plato that's conforming. It's just like pressing into a rock and the world's not gonna affect us because we've already been transformed from the inside out. And here's what happens. When you and I are transformed from the inside out, we're not conformed to the world, then we begin to have the space to see people the way God see people, saw people. Too often we don't actually ever see people. I was asking a question about this story just kind of to myself of why did Jesus have to stop? When all this is happening, why did Jesus have to stop? Because you think about the woman for just a second. What did she come to Jesus for? Healing, right? She wanted to be healed. She said, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. Because I know about this man, Jesus. I've heard about this man, Jesus. I just want to get close enough to touch his robe because I need healing. She had come to Jesus. She had touched his robe and got exactly what she came for. So why did Jesus stop? because he didn't get what he came for. That transaction had already occurred. The woman came to receive healing. She had already gotten that and it had come from Jesus. But Jesus didn't come for that. His purpose was not just transactional, it was relational. And so he stopped, even though the transaction had happened, he said, no, I gotta stop because there's somebody I need to connect with in this crowd. I know big things are going on. I know I'm headed to do something. All you guys are watching and waiting to see what's gonna happen. Everybody's expecting, but I've got something I need to stop for right now. Because his relationship with us is not transactional. It's always relational. And here's the reality. If that's true, if it's true, that his relationship with us is not just transactional, but it's relational, the way he engages us, then his presence in our lives, if you're a Christian, his presence in your life and in my life cannot merely be transactional, it must be relational. Which means that we don't just say, God, I need this, and then God provides it, we say, yep, we're good, we made that transaction, I prayed for it and you sent it, God, thank you for that transaction, that was great. It's not just about him coming and saying, I'm gonna pay the price, you know what? You're de- you, the wages of sin is death, I'm gonna go ahead and pay that price, peace out, I did my job, it's paid, see you later. That's not how it works. We don't come to God to get that transaction. It's not about just that transaction, it's so much more than that because he came not only to pay the price, he came to have a relationship with you and with me and to reconnect us in relationship with God. That you and I can be connected to the creator of the universe in personal relationship with him. We don't just have a relationship with God. We say, you know what, I've got my fire insurance. I've got my get out of hell free card. Thank you, Jesus. We're all good now. Thanks. See you later. No, it's a relationship with the creator of the universe. And if his purpose was not just transactional and his presence is not just transactional in our lives but relational, then our presence in the lives of others should never just be transactional but relational. So when the followers of Jesus are walking with him, we encounter people, we walk in relationship with them. We look and we say, God, open my eyes. I wanna see people the way you see them. I wanna see them differently because this is what Jesus was always doing. Always doing it, right? 
You got the man that's crying out. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they say, shut up, be quiet, leave him alone. And Jesus says, hey, I hear that guy, bring him to me. He didn't just say, have mercy, be healed, see you later. No, he said, I want to see that guy, bring him here. I want to encounter this person, right? Zacchaeus climbs up in a tree. There's a lot of crowds out there to see Jesus. That's why this short man has to climb up in a tree to see Jesus. And Jesus probably saw the crowd. He's like, great, I love all these people. But that guy right there I need to connect with right now. That guy that's up there in a tree. And everybody says, why would you connect with that guy? We don't want to have anything to do with him. He's a tax collector. He's the worst of the worst. You don't need to connect with him. And he says, I want to connect with that guy right there. Because he didn't just see the crowd. He saw people in the crowd. Children were trying to come to Jesus, and the disciples even were like, no, stay away. You know, he's got better things to do. Children, get out of here. And he says, let the little children come to me. You want to make a connection with them. You see it all the time. The lepers, the blind, the lame, the people that brought the man down on the mat, he looked him in the eye, he said, your sins are forgiven. And that, before that transaction even occurred that they were looking for, he said, I'm going to connect with you in a way that you need, even if you don't know you need it. I'm gonna do something a little different. He connected with people all the time. The downcast, the outcast, everybody you could possibly imagine, the people that nobody else wanted to think about, the worst of the worst, the people that voted differently than him. Everybody. He saw the world differently and he constantly was connecting with people. When everybody else even thought, you know what, stop worrying about it. There's a big crowd. Jesus, you got big things to do. He said, no, this is the biggest thing right now. This is the biggest thing right now because he saw it with different eyes. He's not looking at things the way you and I do a lot of times. We need to see differently. Close with this passage, Matthew chapter 9. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. It says, seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. When God opens our eyes, we'll start to see that people around us are downcast and distressed. We might have compassion on them. Because we say, you know what, they're like sheep without a shepherd. A lot of times I tell people, especially when they're working with us in student ministry with things, I say, you know what, sometimes it's really easy to get overwhelmed with how people act, but maybe sometimes we should expect lost people to act lost. Maybe we shouldn't be shocked because they're sheep without a shepherd. And maybe instead of getting frustrated with that happening, it should cause us to have compassion that we would say, man, breaks my heart. Like sheep without a shepherd. And then here's Jesus' response. It says he had compassion for they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he turns to his disciples and he says this, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. These people that are like sheep without a shepherd, I'm gonna show you what this really means because I can look and say this world is so broken and so messed up and these people are like sheep without a shepherd, but he says it this way. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. He says, I'm looking at this broken world and you wanna know what I see? I don't see a world that's like scorched and, and not worth anything. I see it like a harvest field. This is the way I see a broken and dying world. He says, they're like sheep without a shepherd. So guess what that means? They're people that need hope. They're like sheep without a shepherd, so the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I'm not a farmer, so I don't know what a field like that would take uh, to, to harvest. You know, I've never been in a tractor and had all the machines running and all that kind of stuff, and if you are and you say, oh, that's not a whole lot of work, you can tell me about it later. But I just think, I look at a field like that and I say that's a little overwhelming. The idea that, that that's the field and I've got to go. But Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And here's the reality for all of us. Everywhere we go, there are harvest fields. There are people that we need to see differently, that we say, God, open my eyes so I can see them differently. Did you know that most people who don't currently go to church won't go to church unless they're invited by somebody? 
So when, when was the last time you invited somebody to come to church with you? Let me take it even a step further because it's not really about just people attending church. We all know that. Did you know that the number one influence on every single person that you come in contact with, the number one influence is the people that come in contact with them? Not social media, not the news, it's the people that come in contact with them. The number one influence on the people that you come in contact with and that I come in contact with is the people that come in contact with them. Which means that wherever I go, there's a mission field, there's a harvest field. And here's the beauty of it. Wherever you go, there's a missionary there. If you're a follower of Jesus, everywhere you go, there's a mission field and a missionary. The difference is that we might not see ourselves as a missionary and we might not see our opportunities as a mission field. It says pray to the Lord because the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more workers and that's been my prayer. Because the reality is that field right there is pretty overwhelming to me. But I'm not responsible for that whole field but I have been given a space and if you're a follower of Jesus, you're not responsible for that whole field, but you've been given a space. And how amazing would it be if the people in this room said, you know what, I can't do that whole field by myself, but this whole group right here can do that field. We can take care of that field just by taking care of my space. Wherever I go, that's my harvest field. If I'm in school, that's my harvest field. If I'm at work, that's my harvest field. When I go to the grocery store, that's my harvest field. It's not just about transactions. I'm not just going to school to receive information. I'm not just going to work to disseminate information and try to get people to accomplish the job or to find out what I'm supposed to accomplish for somebody else. I'm not just going to the grocery store to get groceries. They're gonna knock on my window and say, hey, we got those groceries, here's the substitutions. And we say, thank you for that transaction, see you later. And we roll up our window and we're done. It's so much more than that, it's relational. It's gonna happen when we say, God, open our eyes to see what's out there. And by the way, especially in this crowd, social media is a harvest field. And I know that Craig talked last week about it, and I've even seen some people say, you know what, I feel like God's leading me to kind of put this stuff aside for right now. And if that's you, that's great. I'm not, I'm not saying, if God's leading you to do that, great. But here's what's happening. I feel like a lot of people might be abandoning the harvest fields because it's a little too uncomfortable. And maybe what we need to do is stay in there. Because it's really easy to be a light around a bunch of other lights. It's not as easy to be a light in a dark place. There's a whole lot of places that need hope. And I'm not just talking about social media. It's a whole lot more than that. Wherever we go, it might be a dark place. There's a harvest field and we need to be the ones. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not, then this part isn't for you yet until you become one. But if you are, let's be workers in the harvest field. Let's wake up and say, God, open my eyes. I need to see the way you see. God, open my heart to see what I haven't seen. Not because everything around me has changed, but because I've changed. Because now I'm seeing things differently. Oh, that God would open our eyes. That we begin to see people differently. That we would become harvest workers. So that that field doesn't start looking like that and start dying that it's harvested before it dies off, before the world overtakes it, before it's over. That we'd be able to look and say, not for our glory, by the way, not for the name of this church, not for your name, not for my name, but for the glory of God, for the name of Jesus, that people would be changed. And if God opens our eyes, and we walk out of here different because now we have a new context. We have that phenomenon that we talked about at the start that now all of a sudden the things that are important to us that weren't rising to the top as we walk through the world are now rising to the top and now we're seeing it differently every single day. And if God would open our eyes that way and we'd allow him to do that and then we'd step forward and by the way, it's not just about seeing the opportunity, it's about taking the opportunity. Say, God, I need your strength. I need you to give me courage and boldness to step forward and share Jesus because if the people of God are not sharing about who God is and the love of God, then who will? But what could happen if the people of God start seeing differently with spiritual eyes, start sharing the truth of God, the work of God in our lives, what he's done for me, that I would say, you know what, here's what Jesus has done for me. I know you're struggling, you're hurting, here's what he's done for me, and I believe he could do it for you. 
I'd love to tell you more about that. That we'd be praying for people. We'd be asking for more workers in the harvest. Do you want to know who doesn't ask for more workers in the harvest? People who aren't harvesting. But when you start doing it, you'll start asking for more. So say, God, open my eyes and bring more along with me. Let's do this together. It'll change history. It'll change your circles. It'll change everywhere you go. Not because everyone will accept it everywhere you go. It'll change your heart, it'll change your life, and it'll change eternity for the glory of God.